Hey, and welcome to Mosaic's broadcast. This week, we are continuing our series, That's What He Said, where we're looking at some of the more intense passages where Jesus shares some hard truths with us. We're gonna see how those hard truths actually lead to real grace. Before we get into it, though, I wanted to let you know that we have launched signups for our summer semester of groups. So if you're looking to connect and find your crew this summer after a year of isolation, head to mosaicchristian.org slash groups to sign up. Up. Let's get started. So a quick family talk uh, as we, before we really get into today's message. John mentioned a couple weeks ago that I am going on sabbatical uh, coming up. So I want to talk about that. And here's how I want to kind of talk about it. I used to do marathons. I would do a marathon every fall. So I'd spend the entire year training. I'd have a regimented schedule, and I'd do my nutrition based on that, and I'd time it, and I'd pace myself, and all leading up to this one fall race, and I would give it everything I had. And at the end of the race, I was absolutely toasted. I would basically collapse across the finish line. Sometimes I even went to the med tent so they could give me an IV and juice me back up with some fluids. I would grab some Gatorade, some water, some food, go, down, uh, go home, and just collapse on the couch for a couple days to try and recover. And after each fall race, I would take a couple months, I wasn't an elite runner by any means, where I would just take off from running. And I would run if I felt like it, but didn't if I didn't want to, and I didn't have a schedule, I didn't time myself, it was just kind of there. And then in the new year, I'd begin a a hard, strict uh, training schedule all over again. So I know a lot about marathons and running, and well-intentioned mentors told me for years a statement that goes like this. Ministry is a marathon, not a sprint. And they were well-intentioned when they said that. And the idea you can kind of figure out is if you start a marathon sprinting like it's a 100-meter race, you're not going to get very far. You're going to collapse and not be able to finish. I get that. But those people were wrong because ministry is not a marathon. Ministry is a marathon after marathon after marathon after marathon. It's as if I train all year for this race. I pour myself out in this race, and as soon as I collapse across the finish line, somebody grabs me and says, hey, great job, Carl. Let's dust yourself off. We got to go over the starting line. You're going to do another one right now, and then they did that five more times, and so I have been running hard for this church for 13 years and four months, and I have not taken as many breaks as I should have, so I am exhausted. I'm exhausted. And let me say, I think this is worth being exhausted for. I really do. God's blessed us with this beautiful building. You've paid off nearly a million dollars over the past year and a half. We have groups. We impact our community. We start new churches, and most of all, we baptized 858 people over the past 13 years. But I am tired, y'all. I am tired mentally, I am tired physically, I am tired in my soul. So I am very open about everything with our board of overseers, and they have been very gracious in saying, Carl, why don't we give you a sabbatical this summer? Not, they said, because you're in crisis, but just because you need a break. And the word sabbatical means time of rest, and that's my goal this summer. We're going to do some typical family vacation stuff, But then we are going to head out in the western part of the country, Utah, Colorado, spend a couple months there, and I can't wait to rest. My family's actually going to be here next weekend. You'll see them maybe because I am staffing a retreat out of state unrelated to my sabbatical. But this is my last Sunday preaching until September. Jonathan's going to preach every other week. We have some Fantastic guest speakers coming in that you know and love. We have some new guest speakers coming in that you will get to know, and I guarantee you will love. But the prayer request I want to give for you to pray for me this next three and a half months is that I get some rest. That's what I need. I just need rest in every way that that word means it. I want to get so much rest that I come back in September raring to go. And the thing this this should remind you of is that Mosaic is built on one person. And it ain't me. It's built on Jesus. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is the one we worship. So here's what's gonna happen this summer is we're gonna preach great sermons. We're gonna connect in awesome groups. We're gonna serve through a great impact week. We're gonna have a great thing for students you're gonna hear about coming up that's gonna be in August. And most importantly, we're gonna baptize more people. So the mission continues. I'm just gonna take a seat on the bench 
while you guys keep running this thing for the next few and a half months. All right? So I want to pray real quick, and then we'll jump into Sermon on the Mount. Um, God, I pray for me, because <laughs> I need some rest. I'm tired, and it, it's good to be tired for a worthy cause. I believe that, um, but I need, I need to be rejuvenated. So God, I pray that you will continue to do great things for Mosaic, as I know you will. And I pray that my family gets some rest. I pray my wife and kids get rest because this impacts them in ways that I see that, that, that they don't even realize. Um, and help me come back as a better, healthier leader as a result of it, able to feed these people who want to follow you. We love you. We love this mission. We love this church. Teach us something good today, God, because we need it. Amen. So a couple months ago, uh, maybe one month ago, something like that, my wife was out of town and my dad was flying through Baltimore, and he had a several-hour layover, so he shows up for church to surprise me, and he says, hey, I'm going to take you and the kids out to lunch after service. I said, great. So I love some good pizza after lunch. We went to my favorite pizza spot, and as we walk in, the waitress slash hostess meets us at the front. She says, how many? We say six of us. She says, well, all of my six seaters are taken, so all I have is these few tables in the back, but you won't be able to sit together. And she told us how long the wait it would be for the six seaters. We weren't going to wait that long. It's too long. Um, but I can look in the back and see it, these three tables. There's like two open, and in the middle, there's one that has a sign that says, um, do not seat people here. And it was against a wall, and there's no other tables over here. So I realized, oh, they're trying to keep these two tables apart for, like, you know, social distancing reasons. I get that. Um, but uh, we were going to be the only ones back there. So I said, oh, this is great. We can just move that other table and put those two together, and then we can sit together as a family. And she looks back at me and says, no, we can't. So real quick, um, soapbox, uh, I, I, I am over a lot of the COVID shenanigans. And I use that word very carefully and on purpose. Um, yeah, okay, easy, whoa, whoa. Um, okay, for those of us who are clapping, here's what we mean, here's why we're clapping, is we're, we're not saying like COVID is a government hoax. We're not saying don't get vaccinated, I got my shots, feeling okay. Um, what we're saying is, well, here's, here's how I say it, is my sin nature wants to start a Twitter handle called COVID Logic. Okay, some of you are already tracking with me. And it would, it would, I haven't, if it exists, it wasn't me, I promise. But I would just tweet things out that go like this. Why in an NBA game do the players on the sideline who are safely distanced from each other not wear masks, but when players get in the game and they're sweating and touching each other, they don't wear a mask? If we really cared about their safety, we would reverse this. It's just logic to me. Or here's another one. Okay, how come when I'm at the airport going through security, I must leave six feet from the person in line in front of security, but then when I get on the plane with them, we share an armrest and touch elbows for the next three hours? I'm not saying I don't want to be safe. I'm saying I just like to be logical along with being safe. So back to the pizza shop. This woman looks at three tables, and she says, it's against the rules. And I said, can I talk to the manager? She looks at me and says, I am the manager. <laughs> I said, look, we can just do this real quick. It's going to be really simple. I'll move the tables for you. She says, I'm not allowed. I said, yes, you are. She goes, no, the owner of this franchise, this particular restaurant won't let me. And this is when I'm just over it, y'all. So I lost it and I let her know it. I looked her in the eye. To her credit, she handled the whole thing really well. But I looked her in the eye and I said, why don't you go get another job for someone who lets you think instead of acting like a robot, fulfilling stupid regulations that don't make any sense and hurt customers and prevent them from sitting with their dad who's only in town for three hours. Have I mentioned I need a sabbatical? <laughs> so my dad's like playing it cool and trying to be a peacemaker. We end up sitting down and my dad's over at that table with two kids and I'm at this table with these two kids and I think I literally have steam coming out of my ears. And then I know as soon as we sit down and after we order what my dad is going to do and I'm trying to send him like a telepathic Jedi prayer message, something that will tell him, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, because we always do whether we're home and out. And he shouts over to our table, and he goes, hey, everybody, we're going to pray together. 
right while the manager's standing there. So we all bow our heads because we're great Christians, and we pray to Jesus to thank him for this wonderful restaurant we're at. And the waitress continues to wait on us nicely, and I'm thinking, crap, she may find out I'm a pastor. She already knows I'm a believer. If she showed up today, she already left. And... I was feeling so badly that at the end of the meal, I took a $50 bill and I walked up to her and I said, hey, I just want to give you an extra tip. She goes, you don't have to do that. I said, no, I really have to do this. And I gave it to her and said, sorry for being an a-hole. And she said, thank you. And I did the walk of shame to my car. Here's my question. <laughs> Does your anger ever get the better of you? Mm -hmm, mm. And it may not come out as it does for me right? My, mine can be like a rage sometimes. Here's, here's how your anger could come out. Come, could come out as a, as a quiet bitterness, right? Your anger could come out as withdrawing. Please don't elbow people during my sermon. That's just <laughs> not fair. It may come out as losing it. Does your anger ever get the better of you? Do you ever lose it at a waitress? Do you ever... Do you ever get mad at somebody and then drive home thinking about the whole time, and when you get home, you just lose it on your kids, not because of them at all? Do you ever have an experience where you see something online, you just vent post about it? Do you ever do this at your spouse? <laughs> Too real. Do you ever have that slow burn that just consumes you? What do you do with your anger? It's not something we can ignore. I heard this sad story out of Germany that happened just a handful of years ago. Apparently, um, every so often in Germany, they'll discover uh, a hidden or buried, I guess, um, undetonated bomb from World War II. And so they have this team that'll come in and defuse it. But what happened a few years ago is that team got up to it, and I don't know if they did it wrong or just touched it the wrong way, but it blew up, killing three people. And if left unchecked, that's what our anger can do. It's an undetonated bomb that will just destroy us or something around us if we leave it unchecked. Kind of reminds me, for the old people, of that Seinfeld episode from years ago where Kramer learned the phrase serenity now, just serenity now, serenity now, serenity now. And that was his way of dealing with his anger, and he looked so at peace. And then the person who had gone insane said, you know, that just stuffs it till later. Serenity now, insanity later. <laughs> Here's the reality is we all need help with our anger. It's something we cannot escape. We need to figure out a proper, healthy way to deal with it. Enter Jesus. We're going through a Sermon on the Mount as a church, taking several months, and he gets really practical in the scripture we're going to look at today to say, here's what you need to know about anger, okay? Here's what he says, Matthew 5, verse 21 and 2. And two. You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. Now, he, if you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. He's referencing right here one of the Ten Commandments, like Moses, Mount Sinai, burning flames, smoke, the whole thing, one of the Big Ten, you must not murder, and Jesus is going to explain to them, you all know this command that's probably easy for you to fulfill, like most of us are not tempted to murder someone in cold blood. I hope, right? But Jesus says, you all know that, but we're going to look deeper because it's about the hard law, not the letter of the law. He says, you know that, but I say, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now, what does this mean? Okay, the Greek language had two words for anger. One was thalos, which was used in Greek literature um, when they were talking about just a pile of straw that caught a flame and burned up real quick and then it was gone. Okay, that was thalos. But then there was orge, this is a long-lived anger. This is the anger of a person who nurses it to keep it alive and won't let it die. And Jesus uses that word, or gay. Everybody say the word, or gay. Kind of weird word. But it's the second form of anger that Jesus condemns. He's not saying don't ever, ever get angry. It's unrealistic. He's teaching us don't let your anger reach the place where it's hostile and vindictive and resentful and trying to retaliate against a person. So a couple of phrases to point out. He says, if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. Now, um, when I was growing up, I had a different 
translation of the Bible than we use. This one's easier to understand. The translation I used said, if you use this Aramaic word, if you call someone Raka, you're answerable to the Sanhedrin. And this just helps it make sense. What it's saying is, if your words get out of control, somebody can sue you. Right? That's still true today. Which I do want to say, I think it's okay for us to acknowledge that there are some idiots in the world Okay, I appreciate the head nods. For example, I don't know if you saw this this week. <laughs> Do not fill plastic bags with gasoline. I mean, this is a message we need from our government, like, to protect us. My thought was, I think we should just let them. It's kind of what I thought about it. I didn't know if this made me more embarrassed to be an American or more embarrassed to be human, but then, then they put, like this went viral, so they put this out. Sometimes when we put on a safety message like this, people use it as a way to look down on others. We ask that instead you use this as an opportunity to reflect on safety in your own life. No, I'm going to look down on others. Thanks. <laughs> Moving on. Just got to acknowledge that are idiots. Matthew 5. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Now, that's a little confusing. He's talking about this in the context of murder. If he said anyone who commits murder is in danger of the fires of hell, I think we could all agree, yes, I'm tracking. That makes sense, Jesus. But he says anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. What's going on here? Okay, context is king when we read the scriptures. If we don't understand a scripture, we've got to look at other scriptures. And we've done this study before where we saw the ultimate bad thing you can say about someone in the scriptures is calling them a fool because a fool doesn't mean they're stupid. A fool is someone who rejects God. A fool is someone who says, I don't need you. A fool, has said, I'm, a fool says, I'm my own God. A fool says, uh, yeah, God, see you later. The scriptures say the fool says in his heart there is no God. And it's not about an idiocy. It's about an arrogance. So really what you could compare this to when we maybe call someone foolish it doesn't carry the same weight. What we would say is, God damn you. Or what we would say is, you can go to hell. And think about this, why Jesus is talking about this in context of murder. Because if you murder someone, you're saying, you are so far beyond hope. You are so far beyond reconciliation. You're so far beyond even God rescuing you from your evil mindset. You don't even deserve to live in a chance at that. And Jesus is saying, if you say to someone, you can go to hell, or the phrase, God damn you, you're saying the same thing, that you are so far beyond even, even the grace of God can't help you. And Jesus says, watch out. When you do that, that's your anger that's gotten a hold of you, and now you're the one who's rejecting God in his ways. Jesus goes on, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple where they worship, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice. Meaning, you've got to deal with this now. Don't put it off. Nothing's more important than dealing with your anger issues. Verse 25 and 6. When you're on the way to court with your adversary, it's kind of using an analogy, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge, who will hand you over to an officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. If that happens, you surely won't be free again until you've paid the last penny. Now, he's ultimately talking here about our debt of sin that we'll talk about Jesus paying on the cross a little bit later when we celebrate communion. But he's also talking about if your anger gets hold of you and you don't deal with it in a healthy way, it will captivate and imprison you forever and you will not get out of that prison until you deal with it. So based on Jesus' teaching here, I want to give us two lies rooted in Scripture that I think all of us buy into one or the other, okay? Here's lie number one. They're both destructive. Anger is bad. Don't get angry. Anger is bad. Anger is immature. Anger doesn't help. And if you buy into this lie, here's what probably happened to you growing up. 
is the household you grew up in probably did one of these two things. Either your household was fo- so full of rage and vindictiveness and slamming doors and screaming, maybe even physical abuse, just uncontrolled anger that you realized really quick, anger is not good because it leads to that. Or you grew up in a household where nobody ever got angry. And no one ever showed angry and no one ever raised their voice and everyone was always nice and we kept things hidden and we don't really want to talk about real issues. We just got to keep it on the surface because we're nice. And you got taught growing up just implicitly anger's bad. So when you encounter someone else, a boss, a teammate or whatever who gets really angry, you think, whoa, whoa, whoa. They should be nicer than that. And you buy into this lie. John Bradshaw wrote the book Healing the shame that binds you. It's been a bestseller for decades. Um, Listen to his quote. It's long, but I think it's really instructive. The emotion of anger in and of itself is not wrong. It just is. It is what we do with our anger that makes it either right or wrong, good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. We may have trouble accepting the notion that anger is a normal, inevitable part of life, We have been carefully taught that anger is always wrong, that nice people don't get angry. Nonsense. The simple fact of the matter is that nice people get angry all the time. The problem is these folks often don't realize they are angry or don't know what to do with their anger. Anger is not wrong in and of itself. The capacity to feel and express anger is part of what it means to be a healthy human being. When we run across someone who seems to have lost the ability to feel or express anger or who has become an expert at stuffing their anger deep inside, we recognize that as a problem, not a virtue. He says if we are shame-based, we don't know how depressed and angry we really are. We don't actually feel our unresolved grief, our false self, and ego defenses keep us from experiencing it. Paradoxically, the very defenses which allowed us to survive our childhood trauma have now become barriers to our growth. And he concludes with, ignoring strong emotions doesn't make them go away. It just drives them deeper inside where they continue to affect us without our consciously knowing it. Now here's the thing, I don't believe that because a famous psychologist wrote it. I believe it because that's what God says. God gets angry a lot. I'll show you just a handful of them. He gets angry about doubting and arguing with God, complaining, pride, self-sufficiency, stealing, not keeping the Lord's word, injustice and bribery, worshiping other gods, impurity, murder, witchcraft, disobedience, and ungodly leadership. Now think about this. If you think anger is bad then when you read in the scriptures where God gets angry, you believe, falsely, that God is dangerous and overly emotional. But that can't be true because the scriptures say God is holy, God is perfect, God is righteous. Think about this. God can't sin. God gets angry. Therefore, anger can't be sinful. So part of your growth in Christ, if you believe this lie, needs to be separating the bad experiences with anger in your past and coming to understand that feeling anger is healthy and normal. Then you'll realize my anger is actually good and righteous. Think about this. Doesn't it make you angry when you recognize your own pride? Doesn't it make you angry when you hear of somebody having an affair? Doesn't it make you angry when you see another trending story of a kid in Baltimore being killed in the crosshairs of gang's violence? Doesn't it make you angry that people don't have hope when they don't know Jesus? Anger is healthy. Now, I know there's a whole lot of us in this room who are thinking, well, thank you, Carl, for justifying me. I'm feeling really good right now. Not so fast. Some of us don't have that problem. We buy into line number two, and it goes like this. Anger justifies any action. And people who believe this say, well, it justifies anything. I can't help how I feel. Here's what they did. They did fill in the blank. 
I did hear one guy who like took this to an extreme, I think. His name was Steven Slater. A uh, news story a couple of years ago, he was a flight attendant for 28 years, and then one day, he lost it. He was on a flight from Pittsburgh to JFK. Apparently, there was a passenger on the plane who refused to sit down during the safety demonstration, and Steven Slater and the passenger like exchanged verbal barbs a lot, and it pushed the flight attendant over the edge. So when they landed at JFK, before they had even reached the place for the passengers to disembark from the airplane, the guy got, the flight attendant got on the little microphone thing and said to the blanking a-hole who told me to blank off, it's been a good 28 years. He threw it down. Everybody's watching with big eyes. He grabs two beers out of the airplane liquor stash. He pulls the emergency chute, throws down his suitcase. All of their faces are pressed against the windows now watching this. He jumps down. He takes his company tie and flings it on the tarmac. He goes over, hops a fence to the company parking lot and drives home (laughs) where he got arrested. (laughs) And we say, well, I'd never do that. Maybe. But we yell at people. We lash out physically, we treat others with contempt, we lose sleep over how angry we are, and it's hard to control our anger because it seems to control us when we get out of control. And we actually seek to indulge this. I learned a new term in prepping for this message called outrage porn. And this term was invented by a New York Times guy named Tim Creter a couple years ago. Outrage porn is anything designed to get clicks or attention through traffic based solely on evoking outrage. And he used the word porn because he says this concept does the same thing that porn does. It gives you short-term satisfaction, but on the other side, leaves you feeling empty inside. And the way outrage porn does it is the short-term feeling it gives is of power and meaning through being offended. And it feels good for you to be morally superior to others. For a moment, you feel less insecure. And they say what phones were for the explosion of porn, that's what COVID year was for outrage. It just made it so convenient. And they found we enjoy riding the emotional roller coaster of self-righteousness. We get addicted to it of living in a state of perpetual outrage. And here's how Tim Creter put it. Outrage is like a lot of other things that feel good, but over time devour us from the inside out. And it's even more insidious than most vices because we don't even consciously acknowledge that it's a pleasure. That's why Psalm 4 plainly says, in your anger, do not sin. And please catch it. It doesn't say, don't get angry. It says, in your anger, do not sin. It's why 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is slow anger. Doesn't say love doesn't get angry. Love is slow to get angry, which is hard to do. So I want to give those of you who tend to believe this lie or at least act as if this lie is true, I want to give you a list of four things to do that will help you with this anger. I got this from Bob Russell years ago. Um, You can write all these down or just wait till I put all four on the screen and take a picture. Number one, spend time in the Bible. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. See, in order to reject the lies of this world, even when they sound good and live in the truth of God, is to be in God's word. Number two, pick your battles. Proverbs 19, 11, sensible people control their temper They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Proverbs 17, 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. A Christian is not someone who has to get the last word in. A Christian is not someone who has to get even. If it's something petty, just ignore it. Three, don't be close friends with angry people. Proverbs 22, 24, don't befriend angry people or associated with hot-tempered people. Here's what this means. If your close friends all love to gossip, you know what you're going to end up doing? Gossip. If your close friends all have a short fuse, you're going to gain a short fuse. If your close friends all indulge in outrage porn, you know what they're going to send you? Links to outrage porn. Number four, keep your tongue in check. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Here's all that means. Learn when to be silent. 
it'll keep you from taking out your anger in the wrong way a lot. So we've identified two lies. Anger is bad, and anger justifies any action. I want to combat those with some truths from Scripture. We said anger is okay because God gets angry, therefore anger cannot be sinful inherently. I show you that big list of God getting angry. I want to show you um, an expansion of one of those. Jeremiah chapter 7, look at this. It's God talking. He says, no wonder I'm so angry. They pour out liquid offerings to their other idol gods. Am I the one they're hurting, says the Lord? Most of all, don't miss this, most of all, they hurt themselves to their own shame. Why was God angry? Because his people were getting hurt. God gets angry because he cares about you. This means godly anger starts with compassion. That you care so deeply about someone else that what they're doing or what's being done to them makes you so angry. This is why healthy anger will lead you to protect children. This is why healthy anger starts with an aching heart for that relationship to be restored. This is why underneath most anger is actually sadness about something that feels lost and it comes up as anger and that anger should drive you to action. Let's replace the second lie. One time, Jesus goes to the temple, famous story, he gets really angry, and I won't give you the whole details, I've done sermons on it before, where these people are basically ripping people off monetarily with money to let them be able to worship, and Jesus isn't going to have it. So the scripture says Jesus goes in and he turns over all the tables of the money changers who were there. Now, that sounds like Jesus lost it, but I want you to catch this detail that John shares with us. When Jesus sees this, it says Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all to the temple. Now, it can kind of sound like Jesus needed a weapon, like he's going to Indiana Jones on him or something, I guess. But what did he do? He sat down. I don't know how long it takes to make a whip, but more than a minute. He sits down, and he thinks, and he chooses a deliberate action that's going to reflect his righteous anger. So here's how I'd phrase it. Godly anger is channeled appropriately. And this is why the godly anger inside of you can awaken the warrior inside to fight for good. Remember that video two weeks ago? This is why godly anger leads you to protect children from others. This is why godly anger leads you to confront even what seems like a small thing so you don't let dissatisfaction grow over the years. This is why godly anger looks at an unspoken resentment and knows it can speak something better into existence. See, it's quite possible that you running from anger, lie number one, is actually you fleeing some soul work that you need to do to deal with your shame. Remember, the anger quote was from a book on shame. And it's quite possible that you blindly indulging anger without thinking about it, lie number two, reveals that you have a healthy passion, even a gift. But if left unchecked, it'll burn down everything around you. So we've got the truth, and we need it, but we need something else. You know what it is. We need grace. And our message is simply grace is available. If you punched a hole in the wall this week, grace is available. If you have fake relationships because you stuff your anger, grace is available. If your children are scared of you, grace. If you have verbally beat the pulp out of someone, grace. If everyone thinks you are so nice, but they just have no idea, grace. And if you don't have grace, Meaning if you don't have Jesus, we want you to go to mosaicchristian.org slash connect and check the baptism box so we can talk to you about getting grace. There's nothing better. There's a verse in Hebrews that says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And we moved here 13 years and four months ago to see to it that no one misses grace. I've heard it said that church is a place where grace is kept on tap and the bar is always open. And that's who we are. 
So you know what a dad who unloaded on his kids on the way to church needs? Grace. You know what the addict who said she was clean but got high every day this week needs? Grace. You know why we do prayer requests and pray for the divorces and strained marriages and illnesses and fractured relationships and empty wombs? You know why we pray for them every week? So no one misses grace. You know why we worship? Nice and loud so we hear each other's voices. So no one misses grace. You know why we study God's word? Connect in groups, serve. So no one misses grace. You know why when we walk out of this room, we don't leave it here, but we're open about our brokenness and struggles in ways that make us look bad. It's so no one misses grace. You know why a pastor takes a sabbatical? <laughs> so no one misses grace. And I know the reason you're here right now is so you don't miss grace. Jesus loves you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he made you on purpose, even with your emotions that tend to get out of control. And he says, if you come to me, I'll forgive you. And even better, I'll teach you a better way to live. That's why we follow him. Let's pray. God, we bought into some lies. And it's hard because we know the truth but it's so hard to live out. So God, I pray that like you do, we will get angry about right things. And God, I, God, I pray that like you, we will take time to use our anger deliberately and righteously. So God, help us walk out of here as warriors armed with a righteous anger to improve this world, but God, help us walk out of here basking in the grace that you give. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Like Pastor Carl said, grace is for you. So if you haven't made the decision yet to commit your life to Christ, head to mosaicchristian.org slash connect, and we will have a conversation with you if you check that baptism box about what it means to get in that tub and declare Jesus as your leader and forgiver. We hope to talk to you soon. Bye.